Welcome back to the show. Today, we are talking with Erica McClary, and she is a doula expert, definitely more of an expert than we are. And she is mm-hmm. also our first guest on the podcast. So we are really excited. Erica, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I feel blessed to be here. We're very excited. Yeah. All right. Um. So I guess we're just going to kind of dive in with questions, but I think first off, if we can just kind of have you explain like the basics of what a doula is, what a doula does for somebody that knows absolutely nothing about. Can can we start by learning how you got into deciding this is like what you want to become a doula? Yeah, sure. That's a good place. Yeah, that that sounds good. Um, So I have three children and my first two children were born in the hospital with an OB, um, very traditional And, um, I, I knew nothing different than that. And when I had my third, I started doing tons of research when I was pregnant. I read like all the books you can possibly get on, um, just how birth should be, you know, the, um, like how our body is meant to give birth and what positions we're meant to be in. And it was like completely opposite of what I saw in the hospital and what I did in the hospital. And so I started thinking like, why, why didn't I know this? And why did it take so much work, so much research, so much reading to know, you know, nature, you know, what's just natural. Um, and so I started looking into, um, just all of that, like that goes into natural birth and, um, and how they've kind of, um, made it into a, a diagnosis, you know, instead of Mm -hmm. just like a natural thing that happens to you or that, that women go through. Um, and I had a lot of friends telling me, oh my goodness, like you should just be a birth coach or you should be a midwife or Mm. you should go into this as um, a career. And at first I was like, oh yeah, that's really interesting to me, but I think I'm just going to share it on Instagram and share it with my friends (laughs) and family and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was doing for the longest time, which is sharing on Instagram, all the things that I had learned and read and everything that I found fascinating. Um, and then I had a few mamas reach out and ask if they could have my services, um, like virtually, like say, I know you're not a birth coach and I know you're not a doula. I know you're not a midwife, but you're so knowledgeable. Like, would you mind helping me out with this? Or they started to ask me questions. And then one good friend just was like, Erica, you need to do this. This is your calling. And I was like, you know what? Okay. I'm going to look into it. So that's, that's how I got here. I just started looking into it and took the training courses and read all the books and fell in love with everything birth. And so now I'm just a birth geek and Love it. <laughs> Tales old as time. I'm a gut geek. Em's a hormone geek. Like we, yeah. this, that you're in great company. Here. But that that's the best way to get into it. I think is when you just kind of naturally fall into it like that, when you're passionate about it and you're doing it and then people start asking you like, Hey, mm-hmm. can you help me? Mm-hmm. Because that's kind of how, like, that's how I got started. And I think that's kind of how Courtney got started too. Yeah. It was just like, I was doing my own research for myself and, you know, like doing everything for myself. And then people started asking like, Hey, how are you doing this? And asking for help. So I love mm-hmm. that. Yeah. So yeah, when you're it, passionate about it, it's easy to help other people. Exactly. Oh God, yeah. yeah. And it's the best thing when you can turn it into a business and, yeah, you know, be able to Very help true. people and then also help your family too. Yes. I've learned a lot in the yeah, just in the process of doing this and things that I would have done differently and things like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's cool. And my sister is now pregnant. And so I get to like go along with her journey and kind of help her through questions that she has and stuff like that. So it's nice. Oh, that's awesome. Well, and you congrats. mentioned, yes, <laughs> congratulations Thanks. to your sister. If she's listening. Thanks. She hasn't announced it yet. So, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like well, I'm not sharing this. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Um and that you did mention something about virtual. So do you do virtual consults as a doula as well or do you just do physical in person? So I I've done um two, a few virtuals just for close friends. Okay. Um and especially when at the end of COVID, a few of my friends were giving birth and I couldn't accompany them in the hospital. And mm-hmm. I wasn't um, a trained doula at that time. I had just been, you know, doing my reading and, and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, and so I did do some virtual, um, just consulting with them. One of them was in the hospital and one of them before she went in, just kind of going over things um, on how to look at different um, uh, procedures or interventions that they come up with, like how to uh, ask questions or what to look for, that kind of thing. Um, so I did just a few of those and now I do offer that. I haven't had uh, many people like besides people that I already know um, yeah. up on it. But um, yes, that is something that I do offer. And then I offer the in-person as well. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was just thinking for our listeners, obviously they're all over. So, you know, mm -hmm. if they wanted yeah. to utilize your services. And where are you at oh, actually? Yes. I am in uh, Ripon, California. For anyone nearby, if they're thinking about it too. <laughs> yes. Anybody, I, I mean, Central Valley is where I live. So I go all over, um, you know, Modesto all the way up to Sonora, which is like an hour away. Um, but yeah, so I do all kinds of uh, things. I can, and, and the virtual thing, you just email me or, you know, contact me somehow. And I, I love talking for So I'll go over anything with anybody, <laughs> really. Yeah. And we'll leave all your contact info in the show links so people can get a hold of you there too. Okay. What does a doula do? Tell us all okay. about that. Uh, uh, so a doula is there for the mother. She is there to support the mother and advocate for the mother. Um, to give her informed uh, or enable her to give informed consent um, and just to be that support person that the mother needs a lot of times um, well most of the time you know your doctor is there for a brief period of time to check on you to check your cervix see how you're progressing and then they leave and then they they go home and then they call them at the very last second to come catch the baby um, and then the nurses, you know, are usually there to monitor you, but they have other patients. So they're in and out and they're mostly focused on, from what I've seen, um, the monitors and all the equipment and doing their actual job with mm -hmm. charting and making sure they're getting everything checked off their lists. And they're not really so much focused on what the mom needs. And um, so that's what a doula is there for, is to help the, um, the mama with uh, pain relieving techniques, relaxation techniques, um, give massages, go run some errands for you, go get you some food, um, you know, that kind of thing. And even support the, the spouse or the partner um, to let them know how to support you, show them how to help you into different positions or, um, or even themselves help you into the different positions and just be that support person that is continuously there instead of being, you know, here for a few minutes, I'm going to check on you and then I'm going to leave for an hour. And then, mm -hmm. but then a doula would be there just continuously. Um, and, and then, like I said before, just helping you and helping you make informed decisions. So a lot of the times the doctor will come in and say, you know, Hey, I think we need to do X, Y, and Z, or, um, you know, for example, artificially rupture the membranes and you might be sitting there. The mom might be sitting there thinking, well, okay, the doctor knows best, you know, so let's mm -hmm. just do it. Um, but they're not giving you the full, um, you know, what the risks are, what the benefits are. They're not giving you all of the information. So a doula would be there to, um, it remind you like, Hey, I know you had mentioned you don't want any interventions. Maybe you should ask what the benefits to this procedure would be, or maybe you should ask what the risk would risks would be. Mm -hmm. We can't necessarily speak up for you or speak up for the mom, um, unless there was something you know, really wrong going on or, mm -hmm. or the mother was in one of those states where she could not speak for herself. I know I've been there in, um, you know, just during labor when you are in so much pain and you can't really speak, just making that eye contact with that support person that knows you well, that can say, you know, Hey, she needs some space right now, or, Hey, she needs this, you know, um, this and that. So basically just to be there for the mom. Mm -hmm. And then also there's, um, there's postpartum help as well, getting you adjusted, helping you to the bathroom and, um, helping you with, um, breastfeeding, getting that first latch, um, just, you know, all those types of things, helping with postpartum meals, if that's a need or, um, helping you, um, know how to change a baby or know how to swaddle a baby. If this is your first time, or maybe it's not your first time, but you still need help. It's just basically to support you, um, you know, and everything that you need. You've already convinced me when I have a baby, definitely hiring <laughs> yeah. a doula. <laughs> it definitely makes a huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a study that we learned about when we were doing, when I was doing my training 
And it was just having a person there solely focused on you, even if they don't touch you at all, just mm-hmm. makes your, um, you, you know, you have so much more peace. Like mm-hmm. you're just so much more comforted than just a doctor there who's in and out or just having that one stable person just makes the birth experience so much more positive. Um, mm-hmm. And there's, it's just kind of crazy. Cause I mean, like I said, in the study, like the lady was literally just sitting in the corner of the room and didn't do anything. She was just a calm presence. And every mother that was interviewed said she made their experience so much more peaceful. Mm. I mean, I can see that it would just be very stress eliminating. I feel Mm -hmm. like that you just know that someone is there that knows everything that you want. Mm -hmm. And so, because as women, we're always like, we need to control every detail. Mm -hmm. Like we need to be on top of everything and who us (laughs) know, but you know, in the midst of labor, I would assume that your brain is just not going to be fully there. So when, you know, I'm going to kind of relate it to like writing down all of your like thoughts and everything and like everything that you have going on, like into a schedule, you know, and like people write down all of their stuff on a calendar, like you have that person there that knows your full plan and everything Mm -hmm. that you want. So I would assume that's what it would be like. Yes. One of the things that we go. Yes. Exactly. Sorry. Some of the, one of the things that we go over in like prenatal visits, um, what, or that I do with my clients is a birth plan. So I'll give them a birth template with things to check off and, um, you know, things to write in that they want. And then we'll go over it on another, in another meeting just to solidify it and make sure that we have everything that they desire in the birth plan. So I can relate it to, or relay it to the hospital staff or the birthing center staff, or if they're, um, having a home birth, making sure everything is set up how they want Um, Mm -hmm. so that they do get that birth that they desire and that they deserve. Sometimes, you know, there's things that are going to go differently. You know, you can't plan every single thing with birth. It's Mm -hmm. spontaneous and things happen, but just knowing what the mom desires and trying to get that as close as can be to her birth plan is what a doula should be doing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Honestly, like, cause while in the pregnancy process, I can't imagine trying to consume all of the information to learn everything yes. possible <laughs> about giving birth. So like, it's just good to have you as an educational resource, like before even getting there to make the plan all back. Cause I'm like, that's only nine months. How much yeah, can right. you fit in your brain in nine months? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's like, so it would be such a new thing. And then on top of that, to feel like you would have to learn everything about exactly. labor and all that kind of stuff. So. And like what your options are, what's be- And so like to just have someone to like bounce ideas off of, ask questions, like mm-hmm. not that you're their own personal Google, but also like you have a lot more experience and knowledge than they would. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And resources. I mean, that is one of my uh, jobs or something that I do offer. I have a client right now that texts me all the time and I love it because she'll say, Hey, I'm sorry to bother you, but can you tell me what this, um, you know, the benefit to this would be mm-hmm. or where to find information on this. And I always tell her like, you're not bothering me. That's why I'm here for you. Yeah. And then I'll send her, you know, an article that I have saved or a podcast that I have had saved, or just tell her my personal opinion and say, this is what I would do, but you know, you don't obviously don't have to do what I would do, mm-hmm. but this is my opinion. Cause that's, that's a lot of the times what the clients are asking is like, you know, a lot about this. So what would you do type of thing? And I try not to put my, you know, my personal wishes or what I would do above what I've learned. Um, but sometimes it, it just comes from experience too, you know, since I have had three babies and I have had them different ways, this is what I liked, or this is what I didn't like, you know, and I mm-hmm. tell them that. I think that's a good experience to have too, like, because you have had babies different ways, like you don't mm-hmm. just have the one point of view, you've kind of seen it all. Mm-hmm. And so you have that background and that experience to be like, Hey, this can go this way, or this can go this way. Yes. Yeah. And even just talking to the, per, uh, talking to the hospital staff, sometimes you think, okay, well, they are the people that know they're right. I I'm wrong, you know, or I can't ask for this or I can't ask for that. And then just having like somebody like me or a doula there to say, no, you can walk around if you'd like to let's ask for, um, you know, a mobile monitor or whatever, mm-hmm. but sometimes you don't know to ask those types of questions mm-hmm. or you don't know that it's okay to do so. And sometimes the hospital staff, since they have so many patients, they're like, Oh, not right now. Or no, that's not going to be, that's not going to work. And my question would be, well, how, you know, she's really wanting to walk around or whatever. She's really wanting to get in the shower. Why wouldn't that be possible? And then most of the time they're like, okay, yes, it's possible. You know, but they just kind of need that extra push or that 
somebody else asking or, you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I need a doula just for my life. I was going to say that. Like, don't we all need help someone to advocate? For- <laughs> yes. Right? I know. I, mean, I, I need to hire just somebody that can just do that for my life. Because I'm that kind of person. <laughs> and I can very much see myself, even though, you know, like I am the way that I am in the health space and I try to stand up for myself. I can definitely see myself like if I was birthing in a hospital being like, just like not wanting to project what I want. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah. Cause a lot of times you think, well, they're the experts. They've gone through this so many times Mm -hmm. and so many times per day that they must know it all. Um, and that sometimes is the issue is they're not focused on just you. They're not, you know, their sole purpose isn't to be there just for you, for you and your comfort. So they might not, you know, want to offer you what they, what they can Mm -hmm. or, um, do what they can do. So that would be where the doula comes in to offer their services or to make sure they're getting the services that they need. And so I want to get into some like misconceptions, right? Because you're talking about like the way we're supposed to like the positions we're supposed to. So what are like some misconceptions you often think that people have about doulas or about more natural births or like, honestly, I'm giving you free reign to go off on a lot of tangents that you want to, because that's just what we do. (laughs) Okay. Well, the first one that comes to mind is birthing on our backs. So Everybody sees in movies and shows, um, you know, the typical mom on her back, screaming her head off and what we call purple pushing, where she's just bearing down, holding her breath and pushing as hard as she can. And that is not how birth should be at all. I mean, yes, you can birth on your back if that's what's comfortable for you, but you should never be forced to Mm -hmm. give birth in that position. And I was uh, in one of my births and it was the longest of my birth. I tore during that birth. Mm. I was not listened to. I felt like I was being talked down to and kind of controlled. And my body was telling me something else, you know, like my body was saying, get up, turn over, turn over, or, um, you need to walk or, you know, and I was told, no, you need to do it this way. And I just, and I didn't have a doula and I just figured, okay, well, they're, they know what they know and I'm going to do what they tell me. Um, and it just wasn't, wasn't the best. And now after doing all the research that I have done and giving birth again, after that, I've realized that that birthing on your back is the, mo- is the hardest position to give birth. Your, um, everything is pointed the wrong direction, you know? So, you know, how birth should work is working with gravity mm-hmm. and have and your, your body naturally knows what to do. Um, there's a, um, something called fetal ejection, where your body just pushes the baby out without you having to push if you wait so long and you are in the, you know, in a gravity, um, or if if you're in a position where gravity is benefiting you and helping you like on your hands and knees or squatting or, um, you know, laid over a a chair, maybe you're laid over the top of your bed. Um, gravity is going to help pull that baby down and you might not even have to push or maybe once or twice. That's what happened with my third. I was just very patient and um, he actually ended up coming very fast towards the end and I didn't have much pain. I didn't have a lot of, um, intervention. I mean, I didn't have any interventions at all. I just birthed how it was most comfortable for me. And that was just like the most empowering, um, birth that I've had and the most empowering situation that I've ever been in. Because after that, I was like, oh my gosh, wow. Like our bodies are incredible. And if we just do what we need to do and what our bodies are telling us to do, what's comfortable for for us, it can go so much better than being told to be on your back and pushing in this position that is going against nature, you know, like your, your cervix and your womb and all of those things are pointing up when you're on your back, when they should be pointing down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that's, that's probably the biggest one for me is when, when I see, even in the birth that I was in, she wanted to stay on her hands and knees and the nurses um, was, were telling her, no, you need to get in the bed. You need to get in the bed. And she was telling them, I, I need to push, I need to push. And they were saying, no, 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 you do not push until I get you in the bed. And it was crazy to see because it was like, they are taught and trained only one way. Like mother just give birth on their, that's it. And she ended up having her baby on her hands and knees and in the position that she wanted to, but the nurse almost wasn't there. Like the doctor wasn't called because they wanted her to get on the bed first. And uh, the nurse did catch the baby, but it was just crazy because if she would have just 
uh, been able to make the mom comfortable where she was at, you know, you come to her, you catch the baby where she's at, then it would have been a lot less stressful for the mom. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a big thing I think is listening to, you know, the mom and also not letting the moms move around a lot is another thing that I've seen and read, um, is just, you know, being able to bounce on a ball or being able to get in the shower, being able to walk around, um, or even if you have an epidural, being able to move from side to side, mm-hmm. um, helping the baby get in a, a better position instead of just being stuck in one position, um, you know, all the movement helps the baby get in a better position. Or if you're having back pain, back labor, there's positions that you can get into that help that. But the hospital staff, most of the time, doesn't tell you anything like that. They don't help you get into different positions because they want to be able to monitor the baby um, the best that they can. And mm-hmm. sometimes when you get into different positions, it's harder to monitor the baby. And so that's, yeah, that's one, that's another thing. <laughs> Um, another misconception I think is needing to monitor the baby, um, the whole entire time intermittent, intermittent monitoring is, uh, the best that I've seen and the best thing that I would suggest doing, um, because sometimes the baby is, uh, or they think the baby's in distress just because the monitor might slip and the heart, uh, the heart rate seems to drop. But what happened was the heart rate didn't really drop, just the monitor wasn't able to catch it right there, mm-hmm. you know? And so they're looking at the lines on the monitor and they're looking at the heart rate on the monitor saying, oh, look right here. We had a dip in the heart rate. Sorry, you can't get up and walk down. Or we're going to have to um, induce because there was a heart rate drop or, you know, things like that. And if they had been intermittent uh, monitoring, just, you know, monitoring every now and then, they would see that the baby has a very strong heartbeat, that the baby is totally fine um, and, you know, the mom would be allowed to um, labor longer if she wanted to, or um, move around if she wanted to, or get in the tub if she wanted to, you know, things like that. Mm. I think um, monitoring 24 seven or or monitoring the baby the whole time leads to more interventions, leads Mm. to um, inductions, it leads to C-sections. It just leads to more interventions that are not needed. So can we talk about interventions a little bit? Cause I have a friend who's a doula and she just gave birth. So she's been on this whole Instagram tangent that I've been loving about (laughs) how, and I'm not here to demonize what anyone wants to do in their birth plan, but sometimes Mm -hmm. they're not like you were going into necessarily necessary when they say they are, Mm -hmm. can you just like speak a little bit to that? Like maybe a case that you were in, or just tell us a little bit about like I mean, you did say about when the heart rate, the monitor slips, but if there's anything else where like they're trying too hard to force those interventions, but maybe it's not necessarily needed. Yeah. Um, so the one, um, the birth that I attended last, she, uh, they wanted to artificially rupture her membranes, her waters and your waters do not have to break to birth the baby. There's plenty of babies that have been born in their waters. Mm-hmm. And it's really cool to see. I haven't seen it in person, but I've watched tons of videos on it and it's, it's really beautiful. Um, but most doctors or midwives, um, or staff and things like that want the water to be broken. Cause they think it'll have, um, or it'll help labor to progress quicker. And there actually are no studies and no proof that say, or that show that breaking the water progresses labor faster. Um, all it does is take that cushion away from the baby and cause distress because now the baby Mm. is pushing up against your pelvic bone with no cushion there. And so rupturing the member, the waters, um, is going to lead to intervention interventions because most of the time they'll break your water and then they'll give you a certain amount of time. And they'll say, we have until this time to, for you to have this baby, or we're going to have to do a C-section because of risk of infection. And that's a huge thing is the risk of infection. They will drill that into your mind. Or if you, if your water breaks at home and you go into the hospital, they'll ask you, you know, what time the water broke and give you a timeline. Okay. If you haven't had this baby by this time, we're going to need to induce, or we're going to need to um, do a C-section. And that's just a huge intervention that doesn't need to happen. Let the waters break on their own or not at all. They don't need to be broken for you to go into labor. Um, and it doesn't do anything, (laughs) you know, and my waters with my last baby was, uh, were broken for almost 24 hours. And if I would have been in the hospital, I would have been induced. I would have been pressured to have a C-section or pressured to have Pitocin, mm. uh, pressured to get this labor going quicker because they would have said you're at risk of infection. But I was texting my midwife and letting her know how I was feeling and letting her know how it was going. 
And um, she just kept telling me, nope, you're fine. You're not at risk of infection unless you're, you know, obviously like putting stuff up there, which I wasn't, yeah. <laughs> you know, she <laughs> said, don't, you know, don't have sex. Don't put a tampon in, don't put a pad in, don't, you know, things like that, which is kind of um, obvious, but it's <laughs> don't put anything up there and you'll be fine. Um, so she said you have at least 72 hours before there's any risk of infection, but I've read in books, you know, some books that give you 48 hours, but the hospital usually gives you like a few hours. They'll mm. say the water's broken at this time. You only have until this time. Um, and so that's a big one. And the, at the last part that I was at, they were asking her and telling her, we need to break your waters to get your labor moving quicker, um, to have you labor, uh, faster and blah, blah, blah. And she kind of looked at me and she didn't know what to say. Cause she was like, kind of in that state. Like, I don't know what to say. I'm just, I don't want that, but I don't know how to say that. So I just asked, what would be the benefits to that? And the doctor said, Oh, it could help her go into labor faster. It could, it, it could progress labor. And then I said, well, what are the risks? And he said, Oh, well, we can cause infection if we do it. And then she's on a timeline. So, um, you know, it only gives her X, Y, and Z amount of hours. And then we'd have to give Pitocin or some type of, um, other invention to get labor started. And then I just looked back at her and she said, no, I don't want that. Thank you. You know, <laughs> cause he, he, he pretty much talked her out of it by telling yeah. her all of the benefits and the risks, uh, which they don't normally do unless you ask. Yeah. So. I feel like one phenomenal thing we've learned from you thus far is ask about the risks of any intervention, right? Anything they're saying, just ask the risks, ask the benefits because yeah, they know them, but it's just not like they, it's not as commonplace. They're right. just like, okay, do it. Listen to me. Right. Cause they know you're probably going to, they're the doctors. It's yeah. like with anything, the they refuse to yeah. tell you the risks for anything. <laughs> yeah. And there's an acronym that I use and I have like a little handout that I give to my clients and it um, is acronym brain and it stands for benefits. So you ask, what are the benefits? And then R, what are the risks? A, what are the alternatives? So mm. are there any alternatives to breaking my water? Um, and then in intuition, um, just listening to your intuition, you know, what is your intuition telling you about this intervention that they're presenting to you or, uh, and then N is nothing. So what if we do nothing at all? <laughs> what happens if we just let the water break on its own or, you know, um, so I always give my clients the handout for, and then remind them, you know, Hey, let's go over brain. And then it helps them a lot to make those decisions. That's phenomenal. I love that. I love that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, like, <laughs> we're eating this up. This is great. I know. I'm so fascinated even though, yeah. you know, kids are not in my plan anytime soon, but Same. I feel like this is, I'm learning a lot. Yeah. So it's, I feel like the more, you know, beforehand though, the better equipped you are when you're yeah. in the situation. Like mm -hmm. I went into my first birth knowing absolutely nothing. I read the book, what to expect when you're expecting, which I would not recommend to read Classic. anybody because <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really tell you what you need to know. Um, you know, and yeah. So I, I just feel like the more equipped you are, the more knowledge you have going into it, the better your outcome will be. And of course, there's going to be things that will happen that are out of your control. You may end up needing a C-section. Yeah. Um, you may end up needing an intervention, but at mm -hmm. least you have all of the information beforehand and, instead of just being on the spot. Like, do you want to do this or we're doing this? This is what mm -hmm. you, you know, these are your only options or whatever. Yeah. And so I love that a doula is becoming more mainstream because mm -hmm. I feel like even just mm -hmm. like three years ago, absolutely nobody knew what a doula right. was. They didn't use a doula. They knew what a midwife was, mm -hmm. but I feel like even that wasn't as common. And, um, if you could maybe just like kind of talk about the difference between a midwife and a doula, because I know a lot sure. of people have both. Mm -hmm. Yes. So a doula can't actually do any, um, uh, procedures on you. Like I can't check your cervix to see how far along you are. I can't listen to the heartbeat. I can't, I mean, unless you want me to, um, but I, you can't do any medical, um, procedures mm -hmm. and the midwife would be doing all the medical procedures and they've gone to uh, much more, or, you know, much more education and have much more education. They've ha had, had uh, more training. Um, mm -hmm. so I haven't done any midwifery classes, which is um, one of my long-term goals. Maybe when my kids are a little bit older and I have more time to de dedicate to that, then I definitely want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but the doula is there like just for the mother and then the midwife is there for the baby and mm -hmm. the mother as well, but she mostly focuses on the baby. Mm -hmm. So like with my third, um, I didn't hire a doula, but my midwife had a midwife's assistant who was in training and she was there and she acted as my doula. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't realize before 
she was there, how much she was needed. Mm -hmm. You know, like my husband is a very hands off um, partner. And I know so many partners are like hands on, like totally in there. I mean, they're in the birth pool with their (laughs) wife, having all the, you know, meconium and blood and stuff on them and they don't even care. But my husband is not that way. (laughs) And so having the midwife's assistant who um, acted as my doula was there was just amazing because she was asking, you know, what do I need and making sure I was comfortable. And so that was really cool. And because the midwife was there checking to see if the baby was crowning or checking to see if she had everything set up and, you know, making sure all of her tools are ready for what the baby came. And she wasn't so much focused on how I was doing which is mm-hmm. what the doula does. I think that's neat because I feel like that's very needed because obviously mm-hmm. you need to be monitoring the baby. You need to be seeing what yes. the baby's doing, but then also, like you said, the mom needs that support too. Yeah. And I mean, uh, I've seen when husbands try to help and they're, you know, the totally wrong direction. It's like petting a dog the wrong way, you know, <laughs> and you can see it in her face that she's just like, stop. <laughs> but she doesn't want to say it. And that the doula would be there to be like, Hey, how about you rub her this way? Or let's do this instead, you know, yeah. and trying to be supportive instead of, you know, the, uh, the opposite. <laughs> instead of I blowing up on your husband. That. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or, and they're also there just to give your spouse a, a, a break. You know, if mm-hmm. they are a hands-on, a very um, involved partner, they do need breaks too, you know? Mm-hmm. So letting you take over instead of them. Yeah. I love that. Um, so you said not to read what to expect when you're expecting, but I want to know if there are any top books that you typically recommend to most people. I do. And I have a list and it's on my website. I don't have it in front of me. I'm so sorry. Um, there's quite a few, um, that I would suggest. And I, I, I apologize. I should have been more ready. It's, well, we can put it in the notes or yeah, something. We'll yeah. link your website and we'll link. To okay. That page. There's, um, there's one it's called a guide, uh, a woman's guide to a better birth. Mm. A, I think that's what it's called. And that was my favorite one to read because it goes over all of the, what ifs like, um, you know, why a C-section would be necessary. Mm-hmm. And then, um, the percentages of like why C-sections are so, um, why are there, why they happen so often and what, and it goes into like the history of it, um, and inductions and things like that. So I learned a ton with that book because I'd always thought like C-sections were just, you know, they're just for emergencies or they're rare. Um, but it's, it's not the case at all. They actually happen more often than you think. And for reasons that don't need to happen. Um, and it, it just, it just goes into so many different aspects that you wouldn't think of that, you probably should, if you're expecting, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now I'm like, now I need to read that. Cause I need to know why C-sections <laughs> happen when they shouldn't. I was a C-section. We were all C-sections because mm-hmm. my brother was a preemie. So they tell her, you know, everyone's at risk afterwards. If you don't have a C-section now we know differently, but not in the nineties. Right. Well, I will say, so now they always tell you if you're going past, if you're 41 weeks, they want to induce, um, they won't let you go past 41 weeks when most, um, if you just let your body naturally go into labor, most women go into labor after 41 weeks, especially if it's your first time. So like my first daughter was born four days late or, you know, it's estimated due dates are just Mm -hmm. a guess, you know, they're just a, a a guess for when your baby would be born, but it's not an actual date. So she could have been born on her due date. She could have been born late. Who knows? You know, Uh, but the most OBs and mid or not midwives, but most OBs will tell you if you go past four to one weeks, we have to automatically induce and then induction often, not often, but a lot of times leads to C-section because your body is not ready. You know, there it's not naturally ready to go into labor and, um, when your baby's lungs are fully developed, it releases a hormone into your body, which tells your body, okay, I'm ready for labor. And sometimes after C-sections, they have to um, quickly move the baby to the NICU because their lungs are fully developed and give them the support that they need because their lungs are developed or give you a shot, um, a steroid, something like that to help the baby's lungs develop. So unless there's an actual emergency with it, where, you know, the baby absolutely has to come out, um, C-sections oftentimes are not are not necessary. And a lot of times they just happen because the, your things are too far along and the baby might be too big or the baby might, um, have passed, you know, stool in the, um, 
in the womb or they're just all these different things that they tell you they try to scare you and a lot of times they just they just don't need to happen with my little sister I know my mom is adamant that that a c-section needed to happen but they told her that the cord was wrapped around her neck so she needed to be born via c-section um but cords are wrapped around baby's necks all the time and Mm. it is usually never a problem. It's a very, very small chance that it's going to actually be a problem because all of the oxygen is still getting to them through their umbilical cord Mm -hmm. and they don't need to breathe through their mouth yet. And so a lot of times if the umbilical cord is wrapped around the baby's neck, they're born, you unwrap it. I mean, in the, and then in the rare case that it's too tight to unwrap, you um, clamp it and clip it or cut it. But usually it's not a, it's not a problem at all, but Mm -hmm. doctors will tell you, Oh, the baby's cord is wrapped around the neck it's not about C section, you know, things like that. Um, but, and then the book goes into a lot of that too. I can see as a first time mom, like hearing all those things where that would definitely scare you into yeah. wanting to do the C-section or the induction or something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, a lot of times I know this isn't like what we were talking about, but a lot of times with C-sections in the baby's uh, lungs, um, don't get squeezed because that's a natural thing that your body does when you Mm -hmm. give birth and they pass through the birth canal, the uh, fluid all gets squeezed out of their lungs. But with a C-section, it does not happen. And so that can lead to asthma, uh, breathing issues later down the road. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of C-section babies don't get that uh, bacteria that they need when they go through the mother's Mm -hmm. um, birth canal. And so they will have asthma later on in life. Mm -hmm. I've also heard, um, like being pushed out of the birth canal, the way it shapes your head and like your nasal canals yes, and all that have, is that a thing too? Like with, yes, when it comes to like breathing and being susceptible to immunity later on down the road. Yes. So when, if you watch, um, like, I mean, like I said before, I love watching like birth videos. I'm like a a birth geek and all that. But if you watch birth videos, a lot of times, if it's like right up um, on the baby's face, you can just see all the fluid um, draining from their nose and their mouth and their lungs. It's just, everything is coming out because, you know, they live in fluid. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're breathing that in. And once they're out of your room and the umbilical cord is cut, then they will need to breathe, um, you know, air and oxygen and, and have those uh, passages clear. So a lot of times you'll see the doctors using those squeegees and, and getting the fluid out that way. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's totally not necessary. It actually causes um, a little bit of just, uh, of what's it called? Acid reflux? Uh, just a little bit of, um, I can't think of the word. Just, you don't want it, you know, like rubbing on your face. It's just a little bit of uh, irritation. 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 Yes. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no <laughs> worries. <Irritation. laughs> causes irritation, which then they don't want to nurse because their throat's hurting. Mm-hmm. And so then that leads to a bad latch. And it just like so many different things lead to um, worse outcomes than they, than they needed to be. You know, mm-hmm. if you just let your body do what it's supposed to do or let it, happen naturally, a lot of the times everything will fall into place, but there's so many interventions. So it doesn't happen sometimes. So do you also help people like, as they're preparing for birth, like nutritionally and like sort of some nutrients they may need? Cause you know, the body just needs to be provided with, or do you like refer them to other people for that? I do both. So I just started getting into like the nutrition side of things. Uh, because I've had a lot of uh, people ask me those kind of types of yeah. questions and I didn't want to keep referring them to others, which I totally do. I will say, you know, I'm not an expert in that. Here's an account to follow. Or here's a book to read. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a book called the real, real food for pregnancy. And then there's also one called, um, I think it's the 90 days of nutrition or something, nine months of new nine months of nourishing mother or something like that. I have it on my website too, (laughs) but it's all about nutrients and getting the actual um, food that you need that are going to be beneficial to your baby and to your baby's development instead of just relying on uh, prenatal vitamins that Mm -hmm. oftentimes are lacking certain nutrients that you need, or they have synthetic nutrients um, that your body just flushes out. So I do want to get more into that, but oftentimes I will just refer them to a book or refer them to a, a, a website or an account, but I do want, or I have been, um, working on just like a guide to put on my website, just to kind of just a very brief guide on Mm -hmm. what to eat, what, you know, what to look for and that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, the, both of us are big fans of real whole foods diets, right? Mm -hmm. So we're like on par with that, but I know that there are certain things where you need extra nutrients and some things because you're growing a whole 
child. Yes. The whole person in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a lot of moms end up being anemic when they're pregnant yeah. and not when they're not pregnant. You know, you might be totally fine when you're not pregnant and then become anemic when you are. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, doctors will say, take an iron supplement, but you might be taking an iron supplement and it's just going right through you because yeah. you're not you're not taking copper with it, or you're not taking vitamin C with it, or, you know, or you might be taking a supplement that you don't even need. Yeah. Um, and so I am totally on board with that as well, eating a whole foods diet and getting your nutrients that you need from food. But like you said, sometimes you do need that extra, a uh, little bit of extra help. So I, I was taking a, um, an iron uh, supplement with my son when I was pregnant with my son, just because I just could not figure out what I was doing wrong. Like I was eating all of the foods that I was supposed to eat. Uh, but I also had two other children at home. I was super busy. And so I just felt drained. And so I did take an iron supplement as well as beef liver supplements. And I felt way better. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. There are those, you know, those things out there, which are good to have and beneficial. Yeah. yeah. I know we're both big fans too, of like preconception <laughs> nutrition and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Like before you're even, pregnant, just kind of getting your body to that state. Is that something that you like help with or would eventually help with also, or yes, gut health is a huge for me as well. I know you guys are super into gut health. Yeah. Yeah. I have, uh, I had gut issues when I was pregnant with my daughter and I had no idea what they're, that that's where it stemmed from. So Mm -hmm. I threw up every day, all day with my daughter. And then for four years after too, I mean, I got down to like 85, 90 pounds. I was super sick. I went and saw like six different GI doctors. They told me it was stress. They told me it was, um, that maybe I was by, uh, bulimic. (laughs) They used me of doing it to myself. Like there are so many different things that came into play and I was getting so, so frustrated. And then when I started, I dove into gut health, um, and I healed myself that way. And then my pregnancy with my son was like, Mm -hmm. I, I did feel a little bit run down. Like I said, like I did take like the iron and the beef liver, but for the most part, I felt great. And I think it all has to do with my gut being uh, healed Mm -hmm. and my gut being atrocious when I was pregnant with my daughter, you know? And so that is one thing on my list that I want to get into. And I said it a couple of days ago, I think on Instagram, like having a healthy gut, I feel like is like the first thing that you need to do before getting pregnant or yeah. making sure that at least that it's, you know, it's healthier mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. because it just, it affects so many things. Yeah. I see a lot of women where they have, um, gallbladder issues after they have their baby because of, you know, like kind of how things were during pregnancy and because of how pregnancy can, raise your hormone levels. And then you have all that excess estrogen Mm -hmm. and that just kind of like exacerbates your gallbladder issues. And so then, so they end up, you know, like doctors, obviously the first thing, well, you need to take your gallbladder out. And I see that a lot with so many women where they have to have their gallbladder removed after pregnancy. And I feel like it's like such a preventable, preventable thing. Yes. And I'm just like, yeah, I think that is so not optional. Just in case you were wondering, <laughs> we don't come with spare organs. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> I tell my half of my clients don't have gallbladder. So I say this all the time and I'm like, nothing against you. Like you did what you had to do. Right. But like, mm-hmm. just in case you're wondering, we don't have spare parts. So <laughs> like, it's another one of those things where they're like, the doctor knows best. Like they're yeah, telling me right. I need to take it out. So obviously I should take it out. But, mm-hmm. you know, I just feel like if you if you are planning on having a baby, I know not everybody plans on having a baby. It just some, <laughs> happens sometimes, happens but sometimes, yes. you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're planning on it, like if you mm-hmm. just do like that six to eight months of like preconception prep and just yep. make sure your body is like really ready. And then you don't pass on those pathogens or whatever to your baby. And yeah. so yeah. your baby is going to be much healthier also. Mm -hmm. and your body will pull. So if you're, um, you know, lacking in calcium or you're lacking in another mineral, it's going to pull from your bones. It's going to pull from whatever you have to give Mm -hmm. to the baby. So after pregnancy, you're going to be that much, uh, more deficient Mm -hmm. and weak or, and, you know, just lacking in those things that you needed because you didn't have enough during pregnancy, because before you got pregnant, you didn't have enough, you Mm -hmm. know, so just making, making sure as best as you can, 
that you are as healthy as can be and have good gut health and have, you know, good mineral levels and all of that, taking care of yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did not plan on having my first and I definitely could tell a difference between being well and my second, just being healthier, um, overall before pregnancy and mm-hmm. having a much more enjoyable pregnancy. Yeah. It and when huge. your minerals are depleted, then you're going to be more tired after your pregnancy. And then so it's just yep. like with the overwhelm of having a new baby. And then, especially if you're a first time mom, like if your body is just kind of struggling to take care of itself, then I would assume you're probably going to be feeling like, Oh, I'm a bad mom because I'm like tired and I feel like I can't take care of my baby. And so, yeah, that's where yep. I'm just such a fan of the prep because mm-hmm. it yeah. just change so many things and make so much so many things yeah. better. And even prepping for postpartum is huge. There's a, a book called the first 40 days and it talks about, uh, or has a lot of uh, recipes in there that are just whole foods and really nourishing, mm-hmm. warm meals for mothers. And it talks about, you know, how long to stay in bed and things like that. But doing all the prep beforehand is huge. Just having those freezer meals, having your support system, having somebody that's going to maybe come, um, uh, you know, not necessarily take care of the baby, but help you take care of your home. So, or your other kids or whatever. So you're able to heal. Um, so when you mentioned prep, that reminded me of that, just being able, or just prepping for postpartum is huge. Mm -hmm. And a doula can help with that too. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, you mentioned that at the beginning. So that is kind of something that you do also, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that would be very beneficial because I, I see that a lot also, with new moms, everybody's like, Oh, the baby, the baby, the baby. And I get Mm -hmm. it. Obviously it's a new human. You want to love on it. (laughs) (laughs) You obviously need to be all about the baby, but she needs to remember the mom too. And I feel like that's so often forgotten. Like people go to see them and they're like, Oh, how's the baby? But nobody remembers to ask the mom how they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yes. I went to a mother's blessing ceremony last night and it was so beautiful. And it was the first one that I've been to but it was all about uh, blessing the mother and letting her know how much she is loved and letting her know, like her circle is here for postpartum. And these are the women that she can count on. Um, and just coming together and blessing her, we gave her a massage and, um, you know, had a nourishing meal together and read her these beautiful verses and letters and, and things like that. And it was all about, uh, lifting up the mother and letting her know how loved she is. And I've never done that before. All I've done is gone to baby showers where it's all Mm -hmm. about like, look at this cute outfit. I got your baby. Look at this blanket. And it's, yeah, it's no. like, you're sitting there as the mom, just like, okay, that's great and everything. But what about me? <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. I love that. I've never heard of that, but that's so nice. that should be, that should be a thing. <laughs> yes. I know. I told my husband today, like maybe that's something that I should offer like to organize these mother blessing ceremonies. Cause it was that. so beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that should definitely, and I understand that, you know, not everybody has like depending on where they're located or they don't all have that big group of support people around them. But if you had somebody like you that could maybe find that for them, you know, like, yeah, I mean, there was only four or five of us, um, there, you know, and one of them was her mom, one of them was her grandma. And mm -hmm. so it was just nice having that support circle of women that she can call on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love that. Now I'm like, everyone needs one of those. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> well, like my sister, I texted her this morning and was like, we're doing a mother's blessing ceremony. Yep. She said, what is that? And I told her, she's like, oh, okay, well, if you want to do it, okay. You know, mm-hmm. you're yeah, like, you're, gonna mom, love you're it. like, I don't want to think about it, but yeah, that's why yeah, you need yeah. somebody to, but I told her it's to plan for that. you're going to like it. <laughs> yeah, I think all of that's so important too. Cause like paternity leave isn't always the most common. So like, even with, there's just not always anyone to help. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like knowing that you have people to rely on. Yeah. Yes. I know. And in other countries, it seems like so different, you know, the mothers are surrounded, they're kept warm They They do ceremonies. They are just supported. Mm -hmm. And here it's just like, okay, you had the baby. You're good. Go back to work now. Yeah. Complaining. You know, you get six weeks now go back to work. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah sad. I know. Yeah. We don't even need to get into that one. That's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the problem with our country, uh, with pregnancy and postpartum is a big thing. Oh my gosh. Do you, um, have you ever been to like a birth center? Like, do you have a lot of clients that do birth centers that, cause it's kind of like an in-between right between like having a home birth and having a hospital birth. So I haven't had any clients yet, um, that have had their births at a birthing center. 
but I had my son at a birthing center. Mm. I was supposed to have him at home. Um, but then we ended up selling our house like the same month he was born and we didn't expect <laughs> our house to sell that fast. And so I was telling the midwife how stressed I was about like, okay, but now we have this birthing tub and what if somebody needs to come view the house and, you know, or things like that. And she was like, let's just do it at the birthing center to make sure it's comfortable for you. And it was just like being at home. Mm. There was a bed and, you know, a sink and a bathroom and it was just warm and um, neutral colors. And it was just like being at home. It was really, it was really nice and comfortable. The only, um, you know, hard part is getting to the birthing center, which being at home, you can just be tucked into your bed or walking around in your, your own home or, or taking a bath in your own bathtub, things like that. Um, mm-hmm. But it wasn't, it wasn't too bad to having to drive there. Cause once I was there, it was just like being at home again. Yeah. But I, I, most of my clients so far have done hospital births. Um, I have one home birth coming up in, in March, um, but she's actually doing a free birth. So there's going to be no midwife, just me. <laughs> Oh, and so that's my first free birth that I will attend. So I'll let you know how that goes. Yeah. So. We need to hear we'll following we follow along to yeah. see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I will let you know. Yeah. And I mean, so, when you think about it, it makes complete sense. Right. Because like, like you said, we are made to give birth. I mean, animals yeah. give birth all the time with little to no intervention, like mm-hmm. that sort of stuff happens. Like the female body is made for that sort of stuff. I'm not calling us animals. Sorry guys. I'm not trying. Oh, to- I like it. I agree. Yeah. Like I've seen lots of videos of cows completely birthing out a whole calves are not small when they come out. <laughs> they are not. I grew up on a farm. So, you know, that was my initiation no. to birth and sex oh, and all of those yeah. things. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Cause we had I the think- goats since we were like always watching them have babies and the cows and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Me too. I grew up on a goat ranch. So saw a lot yeah. of goats being born. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, there was a select few where you did have to help them. Yeah. But, yeah. You're like, it happens. Like, it happens. yeah, intervention sometimes needed a little pushing happens. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. The cow doesn't hear you yell push. <laughs> right. Exactly. And yeah. And most of the time you don't even have to push as, as, uh, as mothers, but uh, you know, sometimes you do need that extra help or you need guidance or whatever. But for the most part, I agree with the animal thing. Like our bodies were meant to do it. We're designed to. Um, and that's, that's a big thing for me. Like when I started doing my research on birth, Um, just seeing how, how everything is set up and how everything was designed is just so cool. Like Mm -hmm. we were made to give birth and Mm -hmm. our bodies are amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really cool. Do you think that there's more trauma inflicted on the child when they have a birth with an intervention? Yes, I do. (laughs) I just, (laughs) I I just don't see how it's possible not to. Mm -hmm. There's uh, the internal monitoring uh, probe and they don't tell you that it's getting actually screwed into your baby's head, but the internal monitor, which I, I would just deny it now knowing what it is. I haven't had it done to my own babies, but I've seen it then. And um, it's just totally unnecessary. They do it because they want continuous monitoring on the baby but they actually screw it into the baby's um, skin right here. And they don't tell the mom that's what's happening. So sometimes yeah. the baby's born, it's bleeding, it has broken skin. And they just tell the mom, oh, it must have, you know, been pushing on your pubic bone or, uh, oh, it must have gotten a fingernail scratch, whatever. And they don't tell her, oh, we actually did that to your baby, you know, oh God, and babies can feel pain. You know, yeah. they're, they're human beings. It's not like when they're in the womb, they feel nothing, mm-hmm. you know. And when on the outside, they can't know it's, it's not magical like that, <laughs> you know, no birth is magical, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I do think that there's more trauma with the more interventions that there is mm. just because it, I was talking to someone, yeah, I was talking to someone about that and they were kind of like comparing their two kids, mm-hmm. like one was born at home and one was born in the hospital and like the hospital hospital birth was very like traumatic for the mom and there was like all like she had a vaginal birth, but it was mm-hmm. still like all these things. And the doctors were like this and this and this, and she didn't have a midwife and she didn't have a doula because it was her first birth. And she was just like, personality wise, like between my two kids, it's like so much different. Mm-hmm. And she's yeah, like, it's been like that since birth. Mm-hmm. I can see that because when when there are interventions or if there's medication given that can make the baby more drowsy and then they don't have that instant connection with you. Mm. Um, I can tell, like I had an epidural with my first birth, not with my second or my third and my baby, um, the first time around, she was more 
drowsy. She was not alert. She it took a long time for her to latch and breastfeed. And uh, I mean, we still have a strong connection, but with my other two, I just feel like there's more of a, a trust. Like, I don't know exactly know how to describe it, but like, she doesn't seem to trust me as much as my other kids do. Mm. Like, obviously she loves me. She comes to me if she has an issue, but it takes a lot for her to do that. And I've often wonder if it's just because of the interventions and, and the medication that was given and just her state of mind, I guess, in my state of mind when she was born um, mm. versus the other two, when there was no drugs involved and it was just immediate connection, immediate skin to skin, like what they need, you know? And, um, and the first person that they, that they get skin to skin contact with, they're going to take in all of your bacteria and that's going to help their gut um, bacteria to grow and to form and it, and the guts connected to the mind and, you know, all of those things. So I do think that there's, um, that there, that can, that can happen, you know, that their personalities are there, just their, um, instincts and their trust and make everything like that can be different from baby to baby, depending yeah. on how they were born. Yeah. All of that is just so fascinating to me, how everything just kind of ties into your, to your whole personality, you know, mm-hmm. throughout your entire life. Yes. Yes. Fascinating. I I agree. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Do we have anything else that we want to touch on? Do you want to finish on like, are there any top tips you have for anyone that's expecting? Uh, I would say just make sure you, you know, try to do as much research as you can, not on, um, I would say not on like superficial things, like what, bassinet should I use? What, you know, what monitor should I use? Like things Mm -hmm. like that, but more of like, what foods should I be eating? Look into positions, different labor positions. Cause even if you don't have a doula there, you still want to know what the most comfortable positions might be. Or if the baby isn't descending, what type of positions will help the baby descend? What type of positions will help your um, hips expand? You know, things like that. Just Mm -hmm. looking into um, those types of um, um, things. Um, and then I would say just, you know, postpartum nutrition, things like that, like stuff that we talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would just, I know having a midwife and having a doula, um, is expensive. Most of the time insurances don't cover it. Um, so just trying to maybe have a little bit of support, like maybe, mm-hmm. uh, reach out to a doula that does prenatal visits and that won't actually attend your birth, that's going to help you, uh, beforehand, you know, giving you those resources that you need, um, helping you you know, with any questions that you might have, just because if you don't necessarily need them at your birth, doesn't mean that you don't need the support beforehand. And it's Mm -hmm. cheaper to do it that way too, you know, to get the support and just schedule like a consult and pay for that or, um, or whatever. And then I would also tell, um, I tell all my clients to, to look into hospital policies, um, and print that out. And if there's anything in there that you don't agree with, you can, um, scratch it out, use a, marker, permanent marker, whatever you want. And then initial it to show, I do not agree with this, or I do not want this. Uh, because when you go to the hospital, most of the times you're signing electronically. Mm-hmm. So you have no idea what you're signing. Um, and you don't have to sign those, uh, admissions papers or policies, um, uh, for them to admit you, they'll tell you that you do. Um, but a lot of, but you don't like, they cannot refuse you just because you're not signing something. Or you can mm-hmm. say, can you please print that out for me? So I know what it says beforehand because they want to just get you in as fast yeah. as they can. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there might be something in there, like I said, that you don't agree with um, and you don't have to adhere to any of their policies, not one. You don't have to do anything that they tell you to do. Um, I mean, they can strongly suggest you do certain things and they can, you know, talk, try to talk you into it all they want, but ultimately it's up to you. And I don't think a lot of women know that going into it, they they say, Oh, the, sorry, it was hospital policy. I didn't know I could like, deny that or, you know, um, things like that. And then, um, I think the last one t- I'll suggest is look into, um, the vaccines that they give at birth and why they give them. And if they're necessary, uh, for me personally, I don't think any of them are necessary, but some people feel differently. You're in good company so, here. <laughs> good. So that's a big one. Um, and I had a client that was like, wait a minute, you wouldn't even give the vitamin K. Doesn't that clot blood? And I said, well, 
do you think you're going to need, you're going to have a traumatic birth? Do you think the baby's going to, you know, drop on the floor and be all beat up when she comes mm-hmm. out? I, I wouldn't imagine so. <laughs> so I don't think you're going to need that blood to clot and your body creates vitamin K on its own. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, unless you're going to circumcise, which we can go on into that thing, but I don't <laughs> agree with that either. <laughs> so unless you're going to, you know, do something like that. I just don't think any of them are, are necessary, but a lot of moms feel differently. So just mm-hmm. knowing the history of them too, like why they give it. And, um, if you can say, or in knowing that you can say no, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it should be an empowered, informed decision, no matter what decision you make. I totally agree. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's just because I'm like, that's okay. We can all believe different things, but like, no matter what you make, make it empowered, make it informed. And that's, yeah. yeah. If you, as if you go into the decision, like knowing yep. what's happening and knowing why you're doing this and then mm-hmm. still going through with it, like that's like, that's fine, but don't just yes. do something to your child that you don't know the repercussions of. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. I mean, we don't have to get into all of this, but just like, you know, the hep B vaccine, like it's for sexual active people and mm-hmm. people, you know, not infants. And so exactly. when I first learned about that one, I was like, why is that even given, you mm-hmm. know, but a lot of women don't second guess it. They don't think like, Oh, that's not for me or my baby doesn't need that. They just think, okay, well, they're giving it to you. It must be needed. Um, so I would say definitely look into all of those. Yeah. I agree. It's like- HPV being given to men so that they can protect their partners. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's Sorry. Another, yeah. That's it, that could be a whole a other two hour podcast <laughs> on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, at least that's not given a baby, is whatever. We can at least that not one's yet, not, right? Yeah, not yet. <laughs> I feel like they're adding keeps, one every day. Honestly. Uh, yeah, the list just keeps getting longer and longer. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, this was so much fun. I feel like I learned. Oh yeah. I have so many, I'm like repeating brain in my head so that I can ingrain it in there. Right. (laughs) I'm going to like, I'm the one that usually edits and I'm going to be like Mm -hmm. listening intently as I, as I edit this back. So, (laughs) well, I'm glad. uh, Yeah. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank Mm -hmm. you for having me. And uh, yeah, I hope that I was helpful. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. You were so helpful. So helpful. I mean, I, I knew the basics of what a doula did, but I, yeah, I learned so this much. Was good. And it was it juicy. Be... People are going to love our first guest. Yay. Yay. <laughs> good. good. Yeah. All right, Erica. So tell everyone where they can find you, where they can reach out to you, um, your website, Instagram, all the things. So my Instagram is mother Eve's birth underscore. Okay. And um, I just, So I had a whole private Instagram uh, for just doula stuff. And then I had a bunch of people like getting confused with my uh, main, my main one, because I was on that one a lot. So I just converted it into one. So if you go to my page, you're going to see like a ton of pictures of my kids uh, and not that many of the doula stuff. So I'm slowly converting it all over Mm -hmm. to that one um, Mm -hmm. page, but I have highlights with all, all the topics that you can think of, um, you know, vaccines, induction, all the kind of things, but I'm also adding more slowly. Um, like I said, and then my website is Erica McClary.com A A R I C A M C C L A R Y.com. And I have, um, a postpartum guide on there. Um, uh, I, I can't remember how much it was to download. And then I have a free, uh, birth plan on there that you can download to, um, check off, bring with you to appointments or bring with you to a birth um, go over with your midwife and things like that. And then I also have, um, like a printout you can print f- with uh, labor positions. You can make it into flashcards or you can put it in an envelope. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff on my website. And then there's like a, um, contact me if you just want to do like a virtual, um, you know, a virtual meeting or just ask me questions or just need resources. I'm almost done with my resource guide where I'll have like other people's Instagrams on there that I, uh, admire or follow that, um, are super knowledgeable and books um, and things like that. I'm almost done with that. And that's it. That's going to be a really good one. I love that. That all sounds amazing. So yes, if anybody out there is planning on having a baby soon, <laughs> having a baby and you need a doula, mm-hmm. I'm just saying you need a doula after this yes. episode, everybody <laughs> needs a doula. We all need them. <laughs> Yes. I agree. Like you said, even if you're not going to have them at your birth, just somebody there that you can ask questions about because yeah, 
yeah. get resources. I mean, like I have tons of local resources, which, mm-hmm. um, I think every doula does, but you know, uh, lactation consultants mm-hmm. and sacral, uh, cranial, cranial sacral therapy. Um, I have like, you know, all those resources as well. Um, if you're in my area, but if you're not, then I can find out for you. You know, that's mm-hmm. one thing that a doula does is, is get resources for you. Mm-hmm. And I can yeah, see, and especially I, as being a first time mom, mm-hmm. that would be super, super helpful. <laughs> I know also the birthing center near me has like a bunch of resources. So if anyone oh, cool. needs to look into like their birthing center might have stuff like that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, this was such a fun episode. Yeah. yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please subscribe, leave us a rating and a review. Go tell Erica how much you liked this episode. Go give her a follow. (laughs) We will leave all of her links and everything in the show notes below. So you can get all of the goodies that she shared and then just follow along with her. But thank you so much for being our first guest. Thank you for having me. I feel so honored to be the first one. (laughs) Yes. It's such a good episode.